to consider. Thank you, Councilmember Aslan. Uh, Councilmember Shimoni. All right. Good evening. Good night. <laughs> Good morning. I don't even know what time it is anymore. I'm still turned around and tired, but I uh, want to thank uh, the team that has been working on this. Jason, thank you specifically, and the Ames staff, WSP staff, city staff, leadership, uh, the community, community leaders, members of council, transportation commission members, other commission members, committee members. This has been such a process and all the public that's been involved dating back 14 or so years. Um, wow, here we are and and what a long meeting and discussion this has all already been. Um, but I, I'm grateful for all the work and time that's been put into this. Um, times are changing, right? And a lot has changed in the last 12, five, three, one years. You know, a lot is changing and and you know, um, I think that we're wrestling with those changes and I'm excited about that and change is good, right? This this Lone Tree intersection, this is a huge intersection today and, and it's planned to be one of the biggest in the town. Um, yesterday, uh, Council Member Sui and I hosted a, a walk along, a site visit with the community and, and as some of the public commenters mentioned, we almost witnessed multiple people getting hit including a big group of 15 of us. We, we literally watched cars zoom past us as we had the green light. And, and that dangerous is, is sketchy. I'm sorry. I challenge anyone to go there and just watch it during peak flow. It is sketch. And, and it, is, it is scary to think about navigating that through the lens of a child, an individual with a disability, or, or someone who is elderly. And that needs to be at the front of our priorities and our mindset. Um, especially given how many folks rely on that intersection to be able to cross, thinking about students, thinking about, you know, stu uh, youth in the neighborhood. So uh, Prop 420 was narrowly supported by voters and voters voted for a connection point with a goal to also alleviate congestion. I, I find there to be inherent flaws with the goals and, and the challenges around alleviating congestion to begin with, but I'll leave it there. And, you know, our goals and our values and the priorities and trade offs all need to be discussed, put on the table with the public and and uh, brought together so that we can really move forward, um, which I think we're going to be able to from today because there's been a lot of public engagement leading up to this. There's been talk about ADOT and concerns about ADOT in Route 66 and, and you know, Jason, you, you mentioned Phoenix and Tucson. And these massive intersections that exist down there, and, and you know, my mind goes to, to that bumper sticker. Let's not let, don't Phoenix flag, right? The flag staff is special. We don't want to be like Phoenix. We don't want to be like Tucson. Nothing against those two places, you know, no disrespect. But but we need to do what we need to do. And I know that ADA is willing to work with us, you know, from firsthand conversations myself. They need a TIA from the city for that five lane option. And then we can continue to mitigate and work through the obstacles that will exist. But I have full faith in, in you, our team, to work with ADOT, and, and I, I will be there with you. I've asked to join you all in those conversations to ensure that we do everything we can to, to make this project work for Flagstaff. You know, not Phoenix, not Tucson, but Flagstaff. Um, so I want to talk about modeling. You know, the modeling is really what's driving this all. And I'm very glad that Dave Wessel with Metro Plan is on the line because Dave, I'm going to have a few questions for you um, about modeling. But before I do, I'm going to say a couple things. You know, models aren't science, and and often we treat them like science. And Jason, you know, towards the beginning of the conversation tonight, you said we want to have an accurate model. But you know, my question for you, Jason, um, really quick is. How do we have an accurate model while we assume 46,500 vehicles will be traveling in 2040? Um, I guess I, and that there's going to be a 70% a, uh, drop off from Sanford and Beaver. Like how, how confident are we in, in that those points alone? Can, can we, I mean, do we have a, a crystal ball? Can we really speak to that clearly? And, and, and Jason, I'd love for you to weigh in and then mix questions into my comments here. Um, but like I love, I love to, for us to have an accurate model too. But I just don't have that same assurance that it's going to be as accurate as we're predicting it to be. Uh, Jason, any thoughts? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, the further out horizon year we get, we lose accuracy. Uh, but 2026, we tried to gain as much accuracy as possible. Like I said, we brought in streetlight data. That was our calibration model. That's something we brought in um, that was new to the city that we really tried to gain um, accuracy with our models. We worked really closely with Dave and Metro Plan and really set up those models, bring in the new land use data, bring in the hospital shift and bring in those data. But yes, as you project forward, you're making assumptions in land use growth. You're making assumptions in population growth. You're making assumptions in driver behavior, demographic growth. Um, so the further out you project, and that's why we really focused on the 2026 year on this presentation, because that's, that's the most accurate data we have. So that's the most, um, you know, that's the best data we can give you. Um, as we go to 2040, I'm not a, a traffic engineer, um, so I'm going to invite Scott back to chime in a little bit as well. Um, but you do degrade some of your accuracy as you go forward. So, Scott, I don't know if you have anything to add to that from your experience. No, I'm, I, I, I think you hit kind of the key topics is, you know, obviously um, the further out you go in terms of, of years, um, you know, population projections obviously change. Um, driver, dr you know, driver mode choice may change. Um, you know, especially if you know, especially if Flagstaff makes um, larger investments or or changes in public transit or, or you know other um, you know other, other background information. But um, yeah, I mean, the regional model is 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 kind of the uh, kind of industry standard on on how we approach this. Um, the only other option there is to do is 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 to make assumptions, you know, the other direction. And um, I'm not sure how much more accurate that would be either. Um, so, I mean, the model is the best tool that we have. Scott and Jason, you know, I, I really appreciate your, your comments and I, I think I heard you speak at the Transportation Commission about modeling and and you really had a, a humble uh, set of comments that you gave in regards to the the um, limitations of the modeling and I was extremely grateful to hear that humble uh, approach because sometimes I feel like the the model is is treated like science and it's just not and so I wanted to, to make that point and and I, and I wonder, can the model better accommodate for human behavior? Because when I when I look at some of these backups, you know, I, I can't help but think, but that that the congestion will induce diversion to other avenues. And you know, as much as we want to pull seventy percent off San Fernando and Beaver, people might end up going on San Fernando and Beaver or still taking Milton. Um, am I, am I correct in that logic? Well, th that's the. Um what I was talking about. So for alternative three and alternative five, we've only taken it back up to sort of that mid network model with some traffic. We haven't taken it back to a metro plan model if we want to look at the whole network level. So we haven't taken it all the way back upstream. Um, there is a level we could go back to metro plan. We could go back to updating the, the, the high level model, redirect some traffic, see what that does. So we've gone downstream. Now we've tr we've had an intersection that doesn't quite work with the volumes the model is telling us it's going through there. We have to go back upstream, come back downstream again. So there's an iterative process, and based on the time frame we were looking at for this presentation, we haven't been able to do that. It's a very iterative process that we work as for traffic engineers, and we haven't been able to make it all the way back up and back down. So we've done the best we can do with that middle level model, the sim traffic. That's where we're at right now. Jason, that's helpful. And I I really appreciate that that honesty. I know that you know option five was a last minute ad, and um, I'm hoping that council gives clear direction today to go forward with option five. I think that's what we're hearing loud and clear from the community. And I would love for you to go back upstream and look at that greater network modeling with Metro Plan with David Wessel, and and come back to us because I think at the end of the day, um, if we adjust and and really look at this holistically. I think it won't be an F. I, I really have faith that that will be the case, but I mean, we'll see, right? Time will tell. Um, but you need direction from us to, to do that. Because um, I, I do believe that links can be set up within the model that will help alleviate some of this um, projected flow coming through these corridors. So more scenarios could be explored and I think should be explored. So Mr. David Wessel, are you on the line? Are you still awake? <laughs> Uh, uh, Mayor. Oh, go ahead, Dave. 
Yeah, the answer to the uh, first question is yes, I'm still on the line. I'm not sure what the answer to the second question was about being awake or not. But uh, I hear um, Miles, mile back, uh, answering. So I'm going to let him kick off and then I'll pick it up. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor, Councilmember Shimoni, Dave Wessel. Uh, please, you are the expert in this area. Please, um, glad you're here and please field it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Miles and uh, Councilmember Shimoni. Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, members of Council, David Wessel, Project, uh, excuse me, Planning Manager for Metro Plan. Uh, Metro Plan uh, runs the regional transportation model. It's been discussed tonight. We've been running it for uh, 20 some years. Um, in terms of its its accuracy, uh, you know, I'm I'm you know fairly pleased with its accuracy. You know, it did a good job of predicting, for instance, you know, the impacts of the Fourth Street railroad overpass. Um, it is a quirky town, but it is relatively small and a relatively simple uh, network. And so the ability to uh, accurately moder uh, model it is is, is good. Um, and then the extra work that WSP has gone through bringing in the streetlight data has just uh, improved that. As far as, um, <clears throat> you know, stepping back and uh, looking at, you know, kind of the, the larger network impacts, um, there are perhaps a couple options going forward. Uh, as Jason mentioned, uh, we have a new model in development. Uh, we should have a, a 2045 uh, projection closer to the um, end of this month where we could uh, run these new um these various scenarios uh it's it is a it's as proud as i i am of the existing model uh this new model is uh even better calibrated and would have uh, more confidence in its results uh alternatively we can uh work with uh the existing model uh, as i said ws and jason has said wsp has done a lot of work in improving its calibration and run those scenarios and look at the results um, at a regional level. Uh, you know, we can uh, examine uh, the volumes, you know, similar to some some that were shown earlier this evening on those uh, streets, Beaver, San Francisco, Milton and Ponderosa Parkway. Um, the uh, I'll just make a comment about Milton and Ponderosa Parkway. Uh, I think people will diverge there, you know, if the you know traffic patterns become predictable enough that, hey, this time of day, I know Lone Tree congests, so I'm going to stay on Milton. Um, otherwise, both those facilities, I think, are too far away for people to actually see and say, oh, I can see I can see ahead. Things are not looking good. I'm going to diverge here. Um, so there's some uh, some limitations to how much uh, traffic will diverge. So I'll I'll stop there and see if that um, addresses your your question. Thank you, David. And I, I actually have some specific questions I want to ask you to dive into. Okay. Can you speak a little bit about the model's limitations to start off? So the model limitations. Uh, I'll start with the I, the, that out year when you go out to 2040, um, you're trying to do your best to project where development will take place and what kind of development will take place. Uh, we use um, the regional plan in terms of planned types of development. We use uh, projects in the pipeline um, and then expert judgment uh, to, um, to project forward. We use in terms of control total population numbers. Uh, uh, we use uh, state demographer projections and then use those to develop uh, employment estimates, working with eco economic development agencies and city staff uh, to make our best guess as to what type of industries 
are needed. Uh, so um, that's probably the the biggest limitation in terms of the uncertainty and inaccuracy. Uh, you know, for instance, you, you heard you know the adjustments that needed to be made for the hospital relocation. Um, these things happen. Um, as far as um, you know, some of the other limitations, uh, certainly not modeling intersections um, with a, a, you know, does create some inherent inaccuracies, but I, I will say that, um, you know, we, we have actually calibrated the model for some of the larger intersections uh, and, you know, it, it does fairly well in terms of um, estimating uh, turn movements. Uh, you know, it's just like a, a sampling, you know, a survey sample, you know, the more, the more cars you have going through, the better chance you have of, of getting within close proximity of, of what's actually going on. And again, we have a simple network. There's not a lot of options for people going from point A to point B, you know, there's not too many intersections. They, they have a choice to go through and you kind of know where they're going to turn. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's almost hard for the model to get it wrong in some ways because those, those options are so few uh, for getting across town. Dave, if I can ask another question, um, what assumptions are being made in the modeling process? In the what process again? Just just in the in the model in general, what assumptions are made? So, um, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, inputs that go into the model. Um, you can call them assumptions, uh, but they're all based on uh, you know data as as well as we have it. So, when we look at you know, there's four steps in the model. You start with trip generation. And so you look at how many trips does a typical household make? Um, we have, you know, six different uh, housing types with trip rates uh, based on um, the you know, Institute of Traffic Engineers. Uh, we have, you know, roughly 50 different non-residential uses again with the trip rates from ITE for each of those. So there you, you can call those assumptions, but they're all based on on field studies. Uh, those field studies, a criticism for some models is that those are based on suburban models um, and we're looking at a an urban model. Uh, we've done a lot of work to bring in uh, pedestrian and bicycle and transit factors and uh, when we calibrate for transit, uh, in terms of overall ridership, we're almost dead on. When we look at movements between districts that we've created, we're still fairly accurate. And when we consider that transit is about 2% of all person trips and we're achieving that level of accuracy, we're doing very well. Um, we look at how uh, the density of intersections are factored, the number of crosswalks are, are factored in, uh, whether we have bike lanes, uh, uh, all those are factored in and um, obviously we have a, a greater concentration of transit bike and ped facilities in the downtown and what we find um, when we introduce those factors is uh, greater accuracy uh, both uh, for vehicle flows uh, we don't have a lot of pedestrian and bicycle counts, uh, but when we do our trip diary survey and we look at um, mode share within the core area of the downtown, the rest of the city and the rest of the region, uh, the model uh, captures that fairly well. Um, so we're uh, pretty, pretty comfortable with that. So, and again, what are the assumptions that go beyond that? You know, we look at uh, curves for, you know, transit ridership response to, you know, walking distance from transit stops, transit ridership response to frequency uh, levels. Um, 
there's a you know a gravity model that's involved in the current model that basically says you know the bigger the attraction and the closer the production the more likely you're to go to to that destination than you are to something that's smaller and further away um that's uh again you know fairly well calibrated you know across the industry uh and you know you hate to to say that you know the the results of the model you know prove all of your assumptions um uh but you know the uh you know we, we put a lot of uh, time and effort into checking all of those inputs checking all those assumptions and uh we do get a fairly uh you know well calibrated model uh as a point you know root and mean squared error the industry standard is somewhere around 35 percent and we're down around 20 percent which is and the lower you get the harder it is to get there so 20 percent puts us as at one of the better models in the nation in terms of calibration david thank you mm -hmm. um and, and I, I i'm i'm putting people to sleep with my comments and questions here so i I want to get through the rest of my comments, but I appreciate your, your time and your expertise and you responding and being with us this evening. Um, so I, I do believe the model needs to be challenged, and I'm glad that we're working on a toolkit and a model 2.0 because I think times are changing and things are changing. And to assume 46,000 per day is a big assumption that I, I struggle with, but uh, I definitely look forward to hearing how future conversations go with Jason and the team in regards to that bigger looking upstream, if, if council gives direction for uh, option five this evening. Um, thank you, David. Um, moving on to the rest of my comments, if that's okay, I'm gonna try to hustle through these. So I'll just make it really quick. Eldon Street Corridor, I believe needs to be bike and pet only, and I'd like to see us do more outreach with the Southside neighborhood specifically and, and get their input on this project since they're gonna be having the most I would argue one of the more significant impacts by this project. Um, the evaluation metrics, I think we need to improve upon council. So if whatever model, whatever design we choose, uh, again, I'm hoping for the traditional number five, I really want us to um, expand upon our evaluation metrics. And, and we can even bring in um, the, the company that Metro Plan is working with. I think it's fear and, and peers consulting. And that's uh, the gentleman who presented to us last week, um, Dr. Contreras, Seth Contreras. And, and they're working together with Metro Plan currently, so maybe we can pull them in to help us with some of the evaluation um, criteria for WSP's work. And, and they can address things like conflict points, speeds, public health, equity, safety, environmental impacts. Uh, expanded travel mode choices, community character, costs, and weighing. These are all points that I know you all understand very well at WSP and Metro Plan and Fear and, and Peers. Um, and so I'm not going to get into the details there on each one, but, but I, I empower you to look beyond just levels of service for cars and queuing lengths in, in the criteria. And I'm hoping, Council, you support that idea. Uh, I think there needs to be some significant safety improvements looked over here. And, and Jason, I'm so glad you're with the team with all your experience. But Jason, I really hope you see the same things that stand out to me um, in regards to safety struggles. You know, like on Butler, the bike path needs to be off the lane, off the road. Uh, something that I think this community is embracing is that a thin strip of paint separating cars and, and you know, 40 mile an hour cars at time and cyclists is not acceptable for our community any longer. And so I love to see us put that separated infrastructure in on that Butler corridor. And I know that you all have worked on a model that shows that. So I would love to see council support that idea and for that safety consideration to be part of the plan. And, and then I'm also concerned about the right hand turn lanes, like going the driveways, going into um, the sawmill section and the other areas past the intersection. I really want to see evaluate all the different contentious points between bike ped and a car. I think that all needs to be evaluated. And the channelized right turn lanes, I think as we've heard from public commenters and others, I think they're inherently dangerous. 
And I have extreme concern about us moving forward with a, pro a project that has channelized rights. I think we just need to take that out of the plans and, and go with that traditional approach and, and create those sharp curves that Jason, you spoke about with the NACTO design of best practices for safety. Let's have that sharp turn, really low speed, and, 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 and while also minimizing the amount of walking distance a pedestrian or a cyclist needs to go through. You know, I've heard the whole channelized right configuration uh, called a Alice in Wonderland maze and trying to get navigate through that. And we need to keep things simple for our elderly, for our children, and really look through those lenses of those populations who are most vulnerable. Um, light prioritization, I'm glad that that's being accommodated here. And I only, the only thing I would add, add to that, Jason and team, is that we look at uh, it, uh, expanding the length of a light if a cyclist is approaching. So making sure that we're, we're aware of when cyclists are pro approaching, allowing that light to stay green longer to allow that cyclist through. Or if a, a bus is coming up and we know that the bus is running late, I've heard this from mountain line leadership, that that could be helpful to allow that bus to get through the intersection. And so that's a priority to me personally, council, and I hope you agree with that as well. Um, in regards to the direction being asked for tonight, uh, what I would like us to direct staff to do, council, is to um, basically implement those evaluation metrics I spoke to and, and then meet with the different community groups, maybe host a town hall or two to kind of get more feedback and then uh, with, the, with the five lane in mind and, um, and then go back through our committees and our commissions just like we did, um, I think hopefully ending in a three to four month time period before it comes back to council again with another five, you know, three to five options, but revolving around five lanes. I think that will give like the community the ability to really choose an option and have clear direction for us council. And I think it'll help the whole the whole process because as we all saw at the commission meetings and such, people were freaking out about the size and they couldn't see past that, right? So we need to address size first and then let's talk about design, right? So that's that's what I think we need to do. And, and that moving forward, uh, the five lane option is the least in cost. It doesn't require additional right of way, which and then the maintenance is the cheapest. I believe it is by far the safest. I know Jason said that these were all safe. And I'm very proud that the team made each option as safe as they, can, they could, given the, the different moving pieces. But I think at the end of the day, I think we can all agree that the less lanes and the simpler design in option five is by far the safest option and the most convenient and efficient for the bike and pedestrian and the most vulnerable users. Um, let's see, I think I am done with my comments. So uh, if, if, yeah, hopefully that made sense, Mayor and Council and, and, and Jason. Um, Jason, do you have any comments or questions for me in regards to what I'm thinking about here? Or does this make um, sense? No, yeah, there's one thing I could clarify just because I was writing furiously notes. I do appreciate your commentary. Uh, for Butler itself, was the request to take the bike lanes off of Butler and put them like we do on Long Lone Tree and get them off the roadway? That was put. To okay. Just want to side. clarify, I wrote that down correctly. So appreciate you clarifying. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And then just to evaluate those different right turns, all those contentious points between bike ped and vehicle movement needs to be really evaluated and done right. This is gonna set the tone for every other project we do. And I really wanna make sure we do it right. So I, I don't mind us taking a little bit extra time to make sure that we do it right. Um, anything else, Jason, or was that, that the only real thing? No, I've taken your notes and I appreciate the input and Thank feedback. You. Thank you. And I'm one member of council, so I, I, I really look forward to hearing what the rest of council thinks, Mayor. And, and I'm really hopeful that we're going to go with option five. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Shimoni. Um, before I get to Councilmember Sweet, uh, I did see uh, Christine Cram Cameron raise her hand if you had something to um, add in. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. This will be quick. So, uh, Councilmember Shimoni, I, there's, there's a first preliminary step to your plan that we can insert, and that is to um, I mean, WSP is going to need to refine the design on option number five. 
uh, run back through, you know, the larger scale modeling, and then we need to get to ADOT and, and speak with them about what we're seeing. Um, I would rather have that done first before we get out to the public and tell them, you know, that something is possible or not. Um, and we do have ADOT in the room tonight if they would like to speak um, to any of the, the requirements, you know, that they have. But, uh, but yeah, I, I would suggest that we, we do a little background work first to check feasibility before we promise anything to the public. I fully support that, Christine, and thank you for that added point. And my understanding is that ADOT needs a TIA from us for a five lane intersection. And uh, at that point, we can talk about mitigations. But if there's an ADOT rep that wants to speak to that, please. Yeah, and they, that. Oh, sorry about that. Councilmember Shimoni, they have a TIA now and, and it will need to be amended. Um, it would be our next step too. So, um, and I see Nate is on. Thanks, Nate. Yes, uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you, uh, Councilman Shimoni. Um, like Christine said, if anything changes in the design, we'll need a revision to the TIA. Currently, we only have a draft. Um, some things to consider when talking about the intersection type that you're wanting to go that you're wanting to go with. Um, our TGPs, as Jason said earlier, we require every um, movement at an intersection to be to be analyzed, um, and we only allow a level service uh, of D or greater for any new intersection for every movement to that intersection. Anything worse than that has to be mitigated. Um, so that's something that you guys will want to take into consideration um, when deciding what intersection type for Butler here you, you want to go with because Butler is going to directly affect the, um, the Lone Tree 66 intersection. I think I understood what you said, Nate, and I appreciate you being with us so late, by the way, and your, your leadership with ADOT. And um, yeah, I look forward to working through those mitigations and seeing how our, our intersection, given the lack of time and, and energy put in, into the modeling and figuring out what level of service it really is going to be. But uh, I like to think we'll be able to find solutions and, and work with you and ADOT in, in making this work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Shimoni. Uh, Councilmember Sweet. 